With the turn of the century, Nebraska's National Guard had become a respected part of our state's military. When the 2nd Nebraska re returned home from its mobilization, they began their annual training again. In 1901, they showed off their ability to fight riots with the demonstration in Omaha. However, funding was cut and became so scarce that the training was cut down in 1902. In 1903, an Ohio Guardsman, who was also a state senator, realized that the National Guard in this uh, country was not on equal footing with the regular army. He then had the Dick Act passed in 1903, when he, which replaced the 1792 Military Act. It stated that the National Guard have the same training, armament, and pay as the uh, regular army. It also required that funding be put uh, into the state's National Guards so that they could have annual training. In 1903, they were able to hold a training camp at Camp Pershing, which was named after General Pershing, who was the director of UNL's ROTC where they participate, practiced drills and training. By 1908, the annual training camps became an important part of our guard, and this led the, to the creation of the rifle range at Camp Ashland. After this had been done, every unit in Nebraska would take turns at the range, range between July and August. Also during this time, they helped with many different state emergencies, such as the suppressing of riots in Omaha in 1909, helping fight fires in Rushville in 1909, and on a Sunday, March 23, 1913, when a tornado tore through Omaha, which left a four-block-wide path of devastation in its wake. Over the next two weeks, they uh, protected businesses and homes from looters, provided medical assistance, and helped with the cleanup effort. As World War I began in Europe, Nebraska's National Guard was experimenting with the newest weapon of war, the airplane. The f first dedicated aircraft using unit was the Fremont Signal company which was reorganized in 1913. The officers and men in this unit brought, bought a small Curtis Model D airplane and assembled it in Fremont. Not much is known about this early attempt of flying in Nebraska other than it was fl uh, the aircraft was flown around town. This aircraft was sadly destroyed in 1914 during an accident. Aviation took off in earnest in 1915 when Captain C. W. Schaefer was appointed chief of aviation in Nebraska. It would soon make Nebraska one of the first states to have an organized aviation division. Schaefer and his associate, Captain McMillan, began flying their new courtesy model aircraft at county fairs and other public events to raise awareness and funds for military aviation. The Air Corps was officially organized on July 19, 1915. To raise more funds, Schaefer and McMillan began barnstorming in Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado. In 1916, President Wilson activated Nebraska's National Guard to help protect lives and property during the border dispute with Mexico. When America entered World War I, the Guard was one of the first groups to be mobilized. Many of the Nebraskans that left for World War I played vital roles in many battles in the short time America was in World War I. After World War I, Nebraska's National Guard mainly built up Camp Ashland into a large training area. They also provided riot control, and when World War II was on the horizon, they began to prepare for the coming war. In 1939, after Hitler began his advance in Europe, extra training was given to the National Guardsmen in the state because of, national de because of the National Defense Program. With the war coming even closer on the horizon, the 35th Division was reactivated with the Executive Order 8605, which included Nebraska's 134th Infantry Regiment and regiments from Kansas and Missouri. In early 1941, training began and when Pearl Harbor was bonded on December 7th and war was declared, they began preparing for the eventuality of the go them going to war. The 134th was first mobilized in 1942 after the Japanese invaded the Aleutian Island chain. However, when they arrived at their destination, Attic Island, they were forced, found no enemies and as they had already left the island. They then spent the next few months uh, on Attic Island as laborers. They were moved back to Alabama in February 1943. They would continue training until they landed on Omaha Beach on July 3, 1944. The 134th received their baptism by fire at the Battle of St. Lowe on July 14th when they began relieving the 115th Infantry. The 134th's first objective was to take Hill 122 
which was a challenge because of hedgerows, which were medieval fences created with stones, dirt, and thick, almost indestructible brushes. The Germans took advantage of these, knowing Americans had no experience of dealing with them. And in the previous weeks, they had caused huge numbers of casualties on American forces. On July 15th, they began their attack and, it, and initially had much success due to Col Colonel Miltenberger's planning. However, the Germans soon started inflicting casualties on the 134th. On July 16th at 7.30 a.m., they had captured Hill 122. They tried to break, uh, begin their attack on St. Lowe itself, but they were told to halt. On July 17th, they, were, they began their assault. On this day, Private Buck Brown won a distri Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest medal in the American military for his actions. On that day, Brown's platoon was pinned by two German machine guns. He and two others flanked the guns and used their grenades instead of their guns. And as they got closer, the Germans killed the two other men, and Brown charged the position, firing his Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR for short. On his charge, he was hit by grenade fragments in his right knee. He then got back up and continued his charge, when he was hit a second time, this time taking fragments in his right shoulder. This, however, did not stop him, and he continued his charge until he was hit a third time by a machine gun bullet through his left arm. At this time, he was 40 feet away from the Germans, and he continued to fire and throw grenades till both guns were silenced. On July 18th, the race for St. Lowe was in full swing, and by 9 a.m., they had reached the outskirts of the city. They were stopped and were not allowed to enter the city because the 29th Division was to be credited with the capture of the city because it was one of their original D-Day objectives. On July 19th, the city was liberated and the 134th began relieving elements of the 29th Division and began the formal occupation of the town. For the rest of the war, Nebraska's National Guard played a vital role in the liberation of Europe, including the helping during the Operation Cobra, the Battle of Mortain, helping break the German lines around the encircled town of Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge, and pushing into Germany and helping the Allies push Germany into surrendering. When they returned home in August 1945, they were welcomed as heroes. After the war, many soldiers were discharged, and the National Guard continued like before the war.